Good morning, Keswa Christian Church. What a lovely day it is today. And thank God, Lord, for being so good that next week we will be able to have a live service where we can attend and truly worship God in the proper way, coming together. Uh, not much to talk about today. Birthdays and anniversaries, you know, will be on the bulletin that you receive through an email. And just so you know that as of next week, this will be on Thursday, we will start sending out invitations. And I'm saying invitations. In actual fact, it's you have to pre-register for next Sunday. Now, you might ask, why do we have to pre-register? Well, we don't want to have to turn people away, but we also want to make sure that we are organized. We have a limited number of people that we can put into our pews, and that's 87. That's total, okay, folks? And on top of it, we will have overflow, which will be in the gym. Now, how this is going to work is as follows. Next Thursday, you will receive on the bulletin or on our webpage, there will be a registration, okay? As it'll say, you may pre-register. So you go to the website, say, and click on Worship Service Link. And then you sign up. You'll put your name in. You'll put in the total number that are in your family that are coming. So we'll know the exact number. And you'll put in your email address. And what will happen is you'll be signed up. And then you also will then receive a confirmation so you know that you have been received. So this will stay open uh, until Sunday if we don't fill up. If we fill up prior to that, then you will not be able to register. Now you might say, well, I don't have uh, an internet, so I can't sign up. Yes, you can. You can phone the church from 9 on Thursday morning until 12 on Thursday noon, and the same on Friday. And Lise or myself will answer the phone and sign you up. So there's two ways to do it. And that's just to give you an idea. Now, you might say, well, why don't you just sign me up? I'll be coming every Sunday. We can't do that. One of the things that you will find you'll have to do is there's COVID screening tests, the questions we're going to have to ask every time you want to come. So you'll have to answer those questions. Now, if you say aren't feeling that well, it's going to say, sorry, you can't come. Okay. Now, if we do it the way, you know, everyone wants to be pre-registered forever, then we wouldn't be able to ask those questions and they're mandatory. So therefore, that's something you have to do. And the way it'll work is we have to adhere to the number of people in our sanctuary at 87. Now, It'll be first come, first serve. You may have a reservation, okay, then you reserve the space, but it doesn't necessarily mean you'll be sitting in the sanctuary. It'll be first come, first serve. And the, there's still possibility that people can come, you know, where they haven't registered because we don't haven't got we aren't filled up, and that's fine too. So I just hope that works. And of course, we'll still be doing the social distancing, the masks, the hand cleaning. Now, one thing we will be doing is there will be no coat hangers in the, uh, in, in the foyer. So what will happen is we'll ask you to take your coats to your seat. Now, there'll be enough room because we're social distancing, so you can put your coats there. This way, when you're ready to leave, you'll be able to exit directly out. We don't want people stopping in the foyer or, say, or the nave and socializing. And you'll be, the elders or the board members will be standing back to say which rows can leave. So I hope you appreciate the work we're trying to do to keep everybody safe. Because heaven forbid, we'd like, we don't want to hear about somebody who caught something coming to church. That would be devastating to us. So I just hope that you, we, and we thank you that you are willing to do this and helping us to do this in God's honoring way. And uh, we pray that everybody will, will follow protocols. And 
And then you can, as I said, you can go online or you can phone, but you have to register to get in. Okay? Today's reading, we're moving on. We have now finished Colossians 1, and we're now moving on to Colossians 2. And I'm going to re be reading the first seven verses of Colossians 2. So if you want to turn to that in your, in your Bibles, I'll, I'll start reading. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those in, at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments, for though I am absent in the body, yet I am with you in the spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Let's just bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, we're just so thankful, Heavenly Father, for the opportunity to, to serve you. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you will give us the opportunity next Sunday to come together as a congregation and celebrate you, to celebrate your death and your resurrection on that cross. And Lord, we, we just pray the Holy Spirit will continue to give us the guidance we need as a congregation. We're here to serve you, Lord. We're here to do your bidding for our lives and also the, the life of this church because the people are the church, Lord. And we love you dearly and only want the best that we may honor you always in all the things that we do. Lord, we lift up those in our congregation that aren't well today, and there are many who are struggling with different things. And we pray that they would have a good day, that you would give them that peace that passes all understanding, that their hearts may be joyful knowing that you are there for them, that you care, that you answer prayer. And Lord, I pray, we never pray for patience, but that we would be prepared to wait if your answer is not forthcoming immediately. And Lord, I just ask that each one of us would prepare our hearts for the, for the word that Pastor Steve is bringing us today, that it may touch us, and Lord, that we may glean information and get a greater understanding of your word, the love that you have for us, that great gift of your son, Jesus, dying for our sins, each one of us. Thank you, Father. And Lord, may your, you be praised today, your name glorified, giving you all the glory. Thank you, Lord. We ask it in the mighty name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. I hope you enjoy the service. Have a great day. Have you ever wondered what marks maturity? It's a good question, isn't it? Because especially if you're a parent, <laughs> you're looking for evidence. What is it that helps me see that my child is growing up, is moving into adulthood and away from childhood? What are the physical markers? And more than just physical markers, more than what we might see on a growth chart in, the fam in our family doctor's office that can help us see that our child is maturing in every way. Our province uh, defines the age of majority like this. At age 18, it says, a person ceases to be a minor. 
But we know that's not at all the same thing as saying at age 18, a person is fully mature, right? Right. There's no magic wand that kind of waves us, waves over us at age 18. Hints of true maturity can show well before age 18, or they might not show for, sadly, even years after. What are the markers of full maturity? Do you recall a time in your life when you were growing up where you felt more grown up? When were those times? The day you got your driver's license? Or perhaps the day you received your first paycheck? You felt grown up. I remember once I was about age 11 when my dad took me out for ice cream, just me, not my brothers, because I had worked like a man, he said, on a project that we'd been doing together. My dad celebrated a hint of maturity in me when I was still a boy, and I'll never forget it. It's, it marked me. Of course, at that age, I wasn't always like that. There were times he still had to say, Steve, grow up, get going. But that day, that ice cream cone and his comment made me feel like a man. It made me want to grow up in every way. That's the kind of motivation that we need as believers in Jesus Christ. We need encouraging evidence that we're growing up. What are those markers? What marks, what are the marks that show that we're maturing spiritually? Do you know? How can you tell if you're flourishing in your walk with Christ, in your faith, or if you're stunted, stuck in, in spiritual infancy? Today, God is going to give us five of those markers from his word. And as we absorb them here from Colossians chapter 2, listen closely, because God will be telling you either, good job, or get growing. Either good job, encouragement, or get growing, some admonition. Let's pray, shall we? God, again, all of us, this preacher, and all of us that are putting ourselves under your word, listening, we all eagerly place ourselves under your authority. We humble ourselves before you, asking you to teach and encourage us, or to warn and admonish us, protect us. Where we feel resistance in our hearts towards you, O Lord, would you help us sense your kindness that leads us to repentance, to, to a change of mind and a change of heart. Where, where you see that we're responding well to your shaping and your teaching, Lord, encourage us. We need that too. Help us to make true progress in wisdom and maturity by what we hear you say today to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You remember that last week, God taught us from his word how the all-compelling person of the Lord Jesus Christ is our all-compelling purpose as Christians. Him we proclaim, remember that? Colossians 1 verse 28, him we proclaim with our words, with our lives as a church, as individuals. And that purpose drives us towards a very clear target. Remember that? That we and those that we influence would be mature in Christ. There's the target. Paul picks up on that in chapter 2, on that target, and asks, what do the rings on that target look like? How do I know if maturity is happening to me in us? And he does this for two important purposes. One, to give us an unshakable foundation, an unshakable foundation for our growth, like strong bones for a body or bedrock for a house. And two, to strengthen us, to strengthen us, to fortify us for the winds that will come the winds that do come, that try to topple us. And so Paul begins in verse 1, Colossians 2, chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 1. For I want you to know, he writes, 
how great a struggle I have. Remember his struggle? Uh, Paul was toiling like a farmer. He was agonizing like an athlete. His struggle was to keep the gospel clear and Christ compellingly preeminent. His struggle was praying for growth and for maturity. For who? He says, for you. And for those at Laodicea, a neighboring town that was only 15 kilometers away from, from Colossae, and for all who have not seen me face to face. Did you see that? That's crazy. Paul put himself out, spent himself, wore himself to a nub so that people he had never met, not in Colossae, not in Laodicea, not even us, because by extension, we're getting this very same letter too. He never met us, couldn't have, right, down the course of time. But so that all of us he had never met face to face would be able to meet Jesus and mature in Jesus. And he goes, here's what that looks like, mature in Jesus. Verse 2 that their hearts may be encouraged. The first mark of maturity is encouraged hearts. Not fearful, not frail, not overwhelmed, not swayed and knocked around by this or that. Timid hearts flake. They, they give way, they cave in. But hearts full of courage don't. They're steadied. As our kids grow into adulthood through maturity, <clears throat> as they increasingly mature, this trait, encouraged hearts, is indispensable if they're to face the rocks that life throw at them. We all know that. The same is true for us spiritually. Do you carry an encouraged heart throughout your day? It's a good question. Do you? Remember what God said to General Joshua as Moses handed him the sword of leadership and as Joshua faced stiff odds stacked up high against him? Do you remember that? Joshua 1 verse 9, you might have memorized this. God says to Joshua, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Don't be frightened. Don't be dismayed. How was Joshua going to pull that off? Would he have to drum up that courage himself with some maybe some positive self-talk? No. The verse keeps going. You know it. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Lean into that truth, Josh. Trust that God is with you just as he promises to be. Look back here at, at Colossians 2, verse 2. Dust off your grade school Eng English grammar for just a second and notice. See that be encouraged there? What voice is that in? Do you remember your grammar? Is it in the active voice or in the passive voice? Meaning, yeah, it is passive, isn't it? Be encouraged. Meaning, we don't pump up this courage and do it for ourselves. We don't generate it ourselves. Be encouraged comes from someplace else to us. Well, from where? Look at the next marker. It comes by being knit together in love. Do you see that there? Verse 2 again. By having unified hearts, linked hearts. That's the second mark of maturity. God's word is so precise, isn't it? Active and passive voice. Notice the same detail here again, so you don't get things backwards. Being knit together, passive. Physical growth isn't something that we just, we do. Well, not directly. We have an indirect part in it, but not a direct one. So, for example, you and I will never go, okay, now I'm going to decide to grow an inch. Grow, grow! We don't do that directly. What we do is we attend to vital activities like eating good meals or getting proper rest or getting the regular exercise that we need and God makes us grow. He's the active party in our growth. The same is true for us spiritually. 
It's almost, to change the, 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 the word picture, it's almost like Paul is taking out a great big earth borer, a, an earth um, drill in these verses to bore down through the layers of soil, through the successive surfaces of spiritual maturity to get down to where we can see bedrock, bedrock, the place where these layers of growth come from. Encouraged hearts come from hearts that are unified by love, Paul says. Did you see that? Isn't it encouraging? You probably have had this experience, I hope you have, to grow up in a family or in a church family where love is the air we breathe. That's encouraging, isn't it? By that, I don't mean a place where you feel wrapped up in warm fuzzies, not necessarily, but a place where we are committed to each other in selflessness, to care for each other, to serve one another, to build each other up like my dad did that day with an ice cream cone and his comment, hearts knit, hearts linked, hearts interwoven and stitched together by a greater selflessness, God's selflessness that loved us first, that moved us so that we can put our important stuff aside to notice and value and live for yours, for each other's, even when it's hard to. Somebody once quipped, you might have heard this before, <clears throat> How many self-centered kids, how many selfish kids does it take to screw in a light bulb? Any idea? Just one. One to hold the light bulb while the whole world revolves around them. How true, eh? <laughs> but a child or a child of God that grows up in a household of love, a household of an environment of selflessness, isn't stunted like that. They learn how to break out of me, myself, and mine. They mature. Life isn't all about them. They learn to give themselves away, knit together in love, to live for God and for others. So ask yourself, do your everyday actions prove, show that you live for others like that? selflessly giving yourself away? Or are you somebody that keeps holding that light bulb? What is God telling you right now? Good going or get growing? Encouraged hearts come from hearts unified by love is what Paul, what God is telling us through Paul. Where does a heart like that come from? Well, Paul digs deeper down, see the verse, to reach all the riches of full assurance, he says. Hearts fully assured. That's the third mark of maturity. Hearts fully assured. Now notice the word riches there. Riches. A farmer that owns land with fertile topsoil is really fortunate because not every farmer gets acreage like that, right? We call soil rich because it has a wealth of nutrients and conditions that make seeds thrive and a harvest plentiful. The fully fertile condition where spiritual maturity thrives is described here in the verse as full assurance. Full assurance, being settled and certain, a complete confidence in what? Planted where? Anchored in what? Grounded where? Well, the third and fourth marks really can't be disjointed. They really can't be disconnected. They go together because hearts that are fully assured, mark number three, are the same, are, are at the same time, hearts anchored in the bedrock of Christ. You see that? Hearts anchored in the bedrock of Christ. And so Paul wants us, back to the verse, to reach all the riches of full assurance. Assurance of what? Of understanding 
and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is, you say it, Christ. Christ. This is so important for us to grasp, uh, grasp, uh, grasp, Christian. The better we get to know Christ, not just facts about him, but Christ himself, as he tells us he is, and the better we understand him, that is, absorb who he is into what makes us, what makes us and what moves us, the more that happens, the more our hearts are anchored, planted. True spiritual maturity is only possible when rooted and grounded in Jesus and nowhere else. Always remember that, Christian. Always. And remember, remember a couple weeks ago or even last week, the reason why Christ go, calls, forgive me, the reason why Christ is called God's mystery right here in this verse is not that there's some secret code that only special Christians get and others don't, not that there's some mystical cipher needed to decode Jesus, not some inside track on Jesus that only really spiritual insiders get, no. Mystery here, like earlier in Colossians, means Jesus wasn't fully revealed in the Old Testament, like in the same way that God has fully and clearly disclosed him for us today in the New Testament. That's what mystery means there. But look how solid Christ, our bedrock, is that our maturity springs from. Watch this in verse 3. In whom, Paul continues, see how solid this bedrock is? In whom are hidden all, all, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Do you see the word all? Don't miss it. Circle it in your Bible if you have to. That's a hugely significant little tiny word, just three letters, all. Oh. Everything, exclude nothing, every bit of the wealth you and I need to know and that you and I need to put into gear so that it works, wisdom, is fully and completely tucked into the treasure trove of Jesus Christ. Jesus is all sufficient for your salvation and mine and for your spiritual growth and mine. Jesus is all sufficient. All you need for your life and for your growth in godliness is Jesus. Not Jesus plus added uh, added anything, added man-made rules, not Jesus plus some unusual spiritual experience, not Jesus plus anything. All is in him. Now you might be asking yourself, Steve, why would God use the word hidden there? Hidden, do you see that? All in whom hidden are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Why would he descri describe Jesus' all-sufficiency like that? Why not use a word like stored? Do you remember the Pharisees? Remember how Jesus said that the truths that he spoke openly about and clearly and publicly about the kingdom were hidden to the hard-hearted and to the proud? Remember that? Hidden to the hard-hearted and to the proud. They were hidden in plain sight but that they're revealed, he said, discovered by those who come to Jesus with Christ-like humility. Well, pardon me, with childlike humility, with childlike trust. The, tre the treasure trove of Jesus is hidden right out in the open, hidden to the hard-hearted, but accessible to the humble, to those that trust Jesus by saying, Jesus is all I need. Jesus is all sufficient for me. He's the sole treasure trove that my eternal life and my growth, my spiritual growth springs from. Here's why this is so important. 
maybe you dig into a lot of reading. Maybe you read a lot of self-help books and a lot of self-help counsel, you know, trying to pick yourself up by your own bootstraps. But that kind of counsel, self-help counsel, can not, can't get to the core of your character and make the changes that are necessary that you and I need to, to have made there. Self-help won't do it. Only the all-sufficient Jesus can do that. What's God saying to you this morning? Good job. You're, you're well-grounded or get yourself to the bedrock. You're relying on man-made additives, on man-made counsel. Let's review what God says maturity looks like here again, from the bedrock up through the layers. He says, Mark number four, hearts that are anchored in the bedrock of Christ, in the all-sufficient worthiness of Jesus, are number three, hearts that are fully assured, are hearts that are unified by love, are encouraged hearts. Do you see the layers? Do you see the descriptions of, of maturity? And hearts that display all those marks of maturity are protected. They're protected because they're in lockstep with Jesus. They're steadfastly planted in him. Watch how Paul says that in, in verse 4 here. I say this, Paul says, I, I tell you this about the layers of maturity and the necessary bedrock, he says, in order that no one may delude you. See that? In order that no one may derail you, dupe you, deceive you, even with plausible arguments, he says. Even with persuasive smooth talk that sounds good, that sounds spiritual, but is tainted Kool-Aid to the soul. Verse 5, for though I am absent in body, I can't be there. I've never seen your face. Remember, never met you, Paul is saying. Though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, praying, rejoicing to see your good order. I love those two words, rejoicing to see your good order. That's a military ter term, like a, a parade, like a military parade, marching together in step with your captain, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith. There's another firmness, another military term, holding the fort, feet planted, not giving ground. I'm rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Do you see how faith in Christ, would you say those three words at the very end of verse 5 there? Faith in Christ. Good. Do you see how faith in Christ is the foundation? Do you see how it's the fuel for growth and the protective fortress for all the layers of what it means to be mature in Christ? It all is anchored there, right there. Now, when our boys were young, our oldest son <laughs> became an adventuresome one. He took up snowboarding. He had so much fun that he urged the rest of us as a family to join him. Yes, yeah, snowboarding. We hadn't even put on snow skis as a family yet. We jumped right to the difficult sport. I wasn't in my, uh, I wasn't in my 20s anymore. And every time I fell, I felt every bone in my body. It got to be a lot of fun, though, as the better we got. Except that my boys got bored with just snowboarding. And they noticed that it was hard for their dad to leverage himself up after every tumble, right? The pain, the inflexibility. My flexibility wasn't the same as theirs. So they added a second touch of fun to their snowboarding. They called it dad tipping. Let's find it funny to topple dad over, and it didn't take much, and watch him struggle back onto his feet again. They found it hilarious, and it was. The reason why Paul is giving us these true marks of spiritual maturity, right there in verses 4 and 5, is that so no lie, see it in verse 4? So that no lie, 
no fierce tornado of falsehood or even a believable breeze that's just bluster, nothing plausible that sounds true but isn't can ever dupe us, delude us, or topple us spiritually. When we're grounded by faith in Christ, growing by faith in Christ, no additives, no substitutes, no subtractions, we are protected. We're protected. You can sniff out what's deadly by remaining anchor, anchored to Christ's all-sufficient worthiness. That's important. How does true maturity, anchored into the all-sufficient worth of Jesus, protect us? That's a good question. Here's an important example for you to see, just an example. There's a believable breeze out there. It's plausible because those who promote it point to their Bibles and they use powerful words to say this. Here's the breeze. Jesus saved us to make us rich. You heard that breeze? Jesus saved us to make us materially wealthy, to get more stuff. And they add, If that's not your experience with Jesus, something is wrong with you spiritually. Have you heard that? They say something is stunted in your faith if that's your experience. Now, I've looked around in days that we could meet here at KCC, and I've noticed that in our parking lot, there aren't a whole lot of Porsches. There just aren't. Is there something wrong with us? spiritually that breeze is spiritually deadly if you don't sniff something deadly in that you're breathing carbon monoxide and you don't even know it how does the all-sufficient worthiness of god of jesus help us detect that in that breeze well do you remember job Those who promote this faith-toppling breeze, God saved us so that we could be rich materially, they point to Job and they say, see, if you stay patient and keep believing like Job did, God will prosper you by doubling your stuff in the end. Isn't that what happened? Isn't that true? Is it true? If that's your take on what God is teaching primarily through the book of Job, you're missing the main point of the 42 chapters. You will be easily toppled by that small breeze. Remember how Satan came to God in chapters 1 and chapter 2, and he said to God twice, Does Job fear you, God, for nothing Look it up later in those verses on your screen. Does Job serve you, worship you for nothing? No. He worships you because of the benefits he gets from you. Take away his stuff, take away his health, and he will stop worshiping you. He'll deny you. The point is God alone worthy of worship. If God should take all my stuff, should remove my health, is he still the all-sufficient, worthy treasure of the universe, worthy of Job's worship, of yours and of mine, or no? That's the main question coursing through the book of Job. So you know the story. God permits Satan to roll out the test. God God knows that Job will pass this test. And Satan wants to just take Job down. Do you remember Job's response when it all began to happen? When he was losing everything, lost it all, including his health? Chapter 1, verse 21. Naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked shall I return. The Lord gave. The Lord has taken away. I came with nothing, I leave with nothing. Blessed be the name of the Lord. God is still worthy of my worship, period, full stop, stuff or no stuff. And oh, it's hard. 
Job suffers, doesn't he? He blamelessly, blamelessly longs for a mediator, a go-between between between him and God. I know that my Redeemer lives, he keeps longing. And then in chapters 38, 39, 40, and 41, God puts himself on glorious display. He says, Job, where were you when I did the things that only God can do? And he layers them on layer and layer, a full display of God's glory right there. Job confesses how utterly unworthy he is before God and how utterly worthy God is of our absolute and unconditional worship. That's the point of the whole book of Job. Those who point, who kind of fast forward through the whole book of Job and just point to the last chapter and and say, no, Job's faith never broke. And that's why God was obligated to bless him, bless him with double stuff. They miss what God himself says about that last chapter, about this whole book, the purpose of it, how what God says in James chapter 5, verse 11. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, of the patience of Job. Yes, we have. We just rehearsed it. And you have seen the purpose of the Lord. What was God's purpose in the whole thing? What was his purpose in the last chapter? To show, James 5.11 says, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. And merciful. Do you see that word? Merciful. God's closing blessings on Job in the last chapter were not owed to Job as if somehow he had earned it by unbending faith. No, it was all owing to God's mercy. We can't earn mercy. We don't deserve mercy. All the more reason why God alone is worth worshiping. The whole point of the book of Job, God's purpose to putting Job through that suffering. My dear brother and sister in Christ, when your faith and my faith is anchored in the all-sufficient worthiness of God, that breeze won't topple you. It won't. You and I were not saved to treasure more stuff. We were saved to treasure the all-sufficient treasure of the universe. Do you remember Zacchaeus? Luke chapter 19. You probably heard, learned the song in Sunday school. Zacchaeus was a greedy little man, not just wee little man, right? Everybody despised this little filthy rich tax collector. Not Jesus, though. Jesus didn't. Jesus saw Zacchaeus' true need. He was lost, and he pursued him home for lunch. I've come to seek and to save what was lost, is what Jesus said. And what was the result? Zacchaeus became poorer materially as he set things straight as he did more than set things straight. This greedy little man was transformed into a man of oversized generosity. He became a giver, not a getter. He became a giver, not a grabber. His net worth plummeted because Jesus' all-sufficient worth had transformed him that day. Jesus himself said it. Salvation today has come to this house. So it's true, isn't it, what James chapter 2, verse 5 says. God has chosen the materially poor, those with a low net worth. He has chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, though they never may never wear a gold ring on their finger, as that context talks about. One more. Remember Paul? Philippians chapter, uh, chapter 4 describes how Paul relied on gifts, charitable gifts from God's people, the Philippians, to, to live on, to survive on. He says in the context there, in those verses 10 to 20, he had to learn how to live with abundance and how to live with scarcity. 
how to live on a lot and how to live with a little. <coughs> Excuse me. How did he pull that off? Verse 13, it's one you've memorized. I can do all things through him, through Christ, who gives me strength. Paul was anchored, content, satisfied in the all-sufficient worthiness of Jesus. It didn't matter if he owned a lot or not very much at all. Jesus was fully satisfying to Paul. And God was supplying all of his needs according to his riches, his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Verse, chapter, uh, verse 19, Jesus was his treasure, not stuff, not stuff. No wonder Jesus says in Luke 12, verse 15, Luke 12, 15, be on your guard against all kinds of greed against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Jesus says that. Those who say God saved you to make you materially rich are pushing nothing more than greed cloaked in God talk. Jesus said, you can't serve both God and money at the same time. You can't serve both God and stuff. Where your treasure is, whichever you choose to love, is where your heart will be also. Here's the question. Is Christ's all-sufficient worthiness maturing you, protecting you? Is he your heart's greatest treasure. Don't be deluded by any plausible or enticing bluster. Make sure, make sure that your faith is anchored in the all-sufficient bedrock of Jesus Christ alone, because there our hearts are fully assured, there our hearts are unified by love, and there our hearts are encouraged. Those are all the marks of unshakably protected maturity. Is that you? Is God telling you, get going or get growing? Let's pray. Lord, together we repeat David's words in Psalm 73. Whom have I in heaven but you, God? Earth has nothing I desire besides you. My heart and my flesh may fail, but you, God, are the strength of my heart and my portion, my treasure forever. Lord, please, would you mark us with that kind of maturity? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Next week, we get to be here gathering in person together. Won't that be great? I'm looking forward to it. But as we do, let me send you into this week with this blessing from our Lord in, from 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. But grow, grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Amen. Grow in grace. <laughs>